Welcome everyone, Quistine here with the Vassalization Guide for Total War Warhammer Free Immortal Empires. Here I am in my campaign as Isabella von Karstein. And in my guide that I did for Isabella and Vlad, quite a few people commented that they couldn't believe how many vassals I had. Or specifically that I had vassalized Kislev, Forgrim, and Ungrim so early on in a campaign. Well, my response to that is... I could have had a lot more vassals by this point if I really wanted to, but I decided to go with only specific factions as vassals because they're useful. So for instance, I don't want to vassalize minor factions because minor factions are not particularly great in general. And then I also didn't want to vassalize every single legendary lord, just the best uh, ones. So Forgrim is a great choice because Forgrim is really, really good. Like dwarves on legendary difficulty have a good amount of replenishment, growth, etc. So all the issues that the dwarves have inherently as a race are made up by the difficulty modifiers. Uh, so that applies to Ungrim and Forgrim. Kislev is less useful, but I just want a faction, or factions in this case, because yes, I am going to vassalize Gestalten over here. I just wanted some factions to hold the northern border, so I don't get to deal with all of that, and instead, they, uh, instead I leave them to fight the wars on this particular side, and also gain territory that is not particularly useful to me, but it's going to be useful to them. So the frozen climate being unpleasant, for instance. So there's plenty of wasteland that I can take, and I do intend to take it. So over here, I'm almost on the verge of wiping out Astrogoth. I mean, just look at his army. Like, those vampires, they're pretty sweet. But how do you manage vassalization? What's the key to vassalization? Because there is a way to almost certainly guarantee vassalization. There's certain things in the game. So for instance, if I go to Grengor over here and I look and I ask him to become my vassals, there's gonna be some things the game is going to tell you over here. So baseline evaluation, faction string, diplomatic prospects, main threat, etc. Main threat means that I'm much stronger than him. He doesn't particularly like that, but because I'm much stronger than him, that also improves, or rather he views me as a strategic threat or I'm becoming one. Um, like, there's a ton of information. For instance, this bounds about a power bar show me, shows me at this particular point, and his strength rank, ranking shows me at this particular point, Grimgore is weak. And when a faction is weak, right, they're going to be more willing to accept things like vassalization or confederation. And many of the things I'm talking about in this video do also apply for any kind of diplomatic agreement, though obviously the trade agreements, all that, do have their own things to worry about. But it's not just as simple as saying, oh, I'm going to trade some territory to Grimgore and he's going to be willing to become my vassal. It's not quite as clear cut. There's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts in this, and you only get a partial understanding by just looking at things like, oh, how much does a faction like you or dislike you? It's not like, oh, a faction has to like you, you have to be much stronger than them, all that. No, there's also... Certain other things that do play a role in this that are not explained in the game, but they are happening in the game. So, how am I able to vassalize Grimgore over here? Well, based on the information the game does tell me, he does not like me, but he doesn't also dislike me that much. So, that's one thing that's helping me out. The second thing is, based on this balance of power, I can tell he's lost every single one of his army. Like, whenever you see a balance of power bar like this, it means the faction you're dealing with is much weaker, and also they've lost all their forces. So if we talk about Fog of War, you can see over here that Grimgore has no army. He's lost everything. He only has this lord, doesn't have any units. The reason Grimgore, of all people, is actually losing against Grisus and Zaytan is because I, I assume that what happened in this particular campaign is the faction potential didn't swing his way. So... Very uh, quick explanation on that. Faction potential, when you start a campaign, certain factions are randomized and others aren't to be stronger. Basically, out resolve benefits, various other benefits that they get in a campaign, but essentially they end up winning. So in this case, in a very, very exceptional situation, Grimgore got the short end of the stick and Greece has got the high end of the stick. But there's also more to this. It's not just faction potential. Oh, it's not, oh, it was just a randomization. I also played a role in ensuring this happened in this particular campaign. There there were things that I did over here that I'll explain 
that ensured this would happen. Because that's the thing, you gotta understand, it's not like, oh, the random dice generator and that's gonna decide, no. There are clear cut things you can do to take advantage of the situation. So one of the things I did is I bankrupted Grimgore. Now he has a bunch of money, so if I trade the demon stump over here, it's gonna give me 5,000. But for Grimgore, who can have tens of thousands of gold, this is insignificant. And this is this turn, when he has no army. So when I traded the Gates of Tsar and Tower of Gorgoth, because I've been conquering this province recently, I basically took away all of his money. And it's only been a couple of turns, but just denying the ability to the AI for a couple of turns to build anything, to, uh, to get new units, to get new structures, means that they'll inevitably lose a couple of critical battles, which makes them weaker, which the fact that they're weaker means they're more willing to bend the knee. It's something you can use for confederations. Like one of the things you can do, and I did a whole video on confederating as Catherine, credit to Mercy the Mad for that. One of the things you can do is you deliberately trade territory to an AI faction that you're looking to confederate, or in this case, vassalize, because you know you're bankrupting them. They're at war with another faction. They might win a couple of battles, but if you keep them at zero money, they will eventually lose, obviously, because their armies are not infinite. That's simply the case uh, that does happen if you take advantage of it. So me trading these two territories, and I traded barracks in them. Like, you notice here that Tarv Gorgoth, Gates Czar have both barracks. I built those. Then I gave them to Grimgore. The AI values, like, when you're trading away a territory, the AI values a couple of things with that territory. So, for instance, the Demon Stump over here is worth 72. It's the economic value there that's highly valued. So the reason I'm able to get the vassalization agreement here is it's just an agreement like any other. It has a bunch of negative modifiers that are gonna make it harder. So baseline evaluation is that part, which I imagine like if I had better relations with Grimgore, that would be lower, uh, but still, but still I'm offering something to him that's very valuable. So. What is valuable are military buildings of any kind. It doesn't have to be a barracks, but the barracks is one of these one because you can build it in one turn at the tier one settlement. So it's a barracks. And another thing to also keep in mind here with region trading is I'm offering him a uh, full control of this province with this settlement. That's something the AI values. Like the AI wants full provinces. It's not something that's explained with diplomacy. It just makes sense, right? The AI is obviously going to value the. Um, uh, full com uh, control of a province as opposed to just one region and a province. So that's the reason I'm able to get this diplomatic agreement. I bankrupted him, trade, traded him territory that um, he considered valuable, and now I'm giving him full control of a province, and in exchange, he's going to become my vassal. Okay, and, and it works the same way with confederation, it's just that the final step, the actual confederation itself, you gotta wait until uh, until your diplomatic relation is good enough. So obviously having positive relations with the faction makes them more willing to confederate or vassalize or something like that. But it's not strictly necessary. I think it's, it is, it helps, but it's not uh, critical. You can vassalize and confederate plenty of factions or get diplomatic agreements with plenty of factions even when you hate each other. Like you can have military alliances with factions that you have minus 500 relations with. By just trading away critical territory to them, being much stronger than them, them losing all of their armies, uh, maybe being even being reduced in territory, because that's actually something that's going to affect faction strength. Like faction strength, is kind of like one of the the strength ranking is a fairly nebulous term, but it basically means territory, higher level settlements count for it, armies count for faction strength, but also military alliances do count for faction strength, though it's not reflected in this ranking at all. So I'm strength rank one, he's 114, but he has no allies. I have an ally, I have Gelt, and I have three vassals, four vassals with him right now. That actually helps me out in a kind of invisible way. I say invisible because it's not reflected necessarily in the game. Basically, you having allies, you having vassals, you having a good chunk of territory, Obviously, the territory and armies you have gets counted, but not necessarily your military allies and vassals, but it does count. One thing to keep in mind about this, and very important point, is that if a faction has vassals and allies and all that, they're actually going to be, they're going to consider themselves, and, and other factions will consider them much harder. I'm sure anyone who's played the campaign as, say, the Warriors of Chaos may notice the following. When you play one of those campaigns, or play a campaign like this, and you get, or once you get a couple of vassals, you will notice, even 
if you hold the exact same amount of territory and have the exact same armies, you will notice one thing. You'll notice far fewer declarations of war. Like, over here in this campaign, I think I've gotten none or maybe one or two, uh, two declarations of war. It's not like I'm not vulnerable. I am in many points. But because I'm, because I'm so strong and I have vassals and I've had them for a good portion of this campaign and now I have a military ally, factions are less likely to mess with me. Uh, they are willing to mess with my, my allies, so the AI is still going to calculate against factions. So, like, for instance, Scrag declared war on Gelt over here. After I had finished beating Scrag up, I got the peace agreement. He declared war on him, uh, but he didn't declare a war on me. I just joined because, well, I'm allied with Gelt. But that's something you need to understand about how the AI acts. But let's talk a bit more about uh, vassalization. So... Gelt over here is strength rank 37. I've got pretty decent relationship with him, plus 81 going to 107. Uh, that's because uh, Vlad gets a huge amount of diplomatic relations to the Empire for the Lamian. So the Lamian is giving me plus 30 diplomatic relations with uh, human factions, and Vlad has a skill line that gives him plus 40 with the Empire specifically. So that's actually contributed. So it's plus 70 from that. That's a huge contribution there. That's um, overcoming a lot of the issues that my relationship with the Galt has. But if I try and vassalize him, even if I trade him territory, you can see the territory itself is uh, 40, but the baseline evaluation is still minus 70. Not quite as bad as Grimgore was, but still minus 70. Um, and, the, and you might notice something. The relative faction strength, even though I am significantly stronger than Galt, sure, sure, not as strong as I was against Grimgore, but the relative action strength is working against me. It's in the negative here. That's because I'm allied with Gelt. One of the things I've made a point in several videos is that if you're looking to confederate a faction, allying them is not a good idea because your strength is going to be added to their strength in terms of how they I perceive these things. Again, it's not something that's explained by the game at any point, but it does happen. Because I can look then at Carl Franz, with whom I have a much worse relationship, but you notice that he's actually easier. He's only minus 71 uh, over there with vassalization, whereas Gelt is 82. And Carl Franz is stronger. Like, he's strength rank 17. He's much stronger than Gelt. Holds a lot more territory. Have worse relationship. He has plenty of allies in this case, and he's easier to vassalize the Gelt. Now, I won't vassalize Carl France. I could have at this point, but one of the victory conditions from Vlad is to actually uh, destroy uh, Carl France. So that's the reason I'm not doing it. But uh, you should, I should point out that the military allies he does have are pretty pathetic. So that's the reason I can I could still vassalize him. It's not like these are strong factions like Talibayim was a land all that. The only one that has any strength is um, Carcassonne, and it's and Carcassonne doesn't is not really a powerhouse either in this particular campaign. Only a couple of territories, so he's not really strong. But again, he's easier to vassalize than Gelt. So you having a military alliance can really backfire. Of course, the benefit of a military alliance is that you have better relations, so that kind of compensates for it. But basically, one of the key ways to ensure a vassalization agreement or a confederation is being much stronger than faction, because that's how you get them to submit to you. Okay, other things, another thing, it's, um, those are just some things, so bankrupting a faction, being much stronger than them, them losing the armies because you bankrupted them, trading away territory, uh, full territories, full provinces to them, selling them valuable territory with barracks, uh, which are worth far more than economic buildings, all of that helps, but it's not just uh, that, there's another thing to keep in mind over here, which I'm going to showcase over here with Castalton. So Castalton really dislikes me. He has a minus 129 diplomat, uh, vassalization chance, and yet I can vassalize him. Pretty simple. And it's just the lair of the Troll King. Like, if I offer him help it, which is significantly more valuable, you can see it's still minus 100. Like, it's not... Like, help it doesn't have a military building. Lair of the Troll King is a tier 2 settlement versus tier 3 for help it. So help it should actually be more valuable. And in every way it should... It is, right? But, um, actually, like, just um, take a look. Let's see if I can trade that. No, I can't. Um, 
Let's use Trog, actually, over here. Maybe I can trade some territory away from him. So if we look at Trog, if I give him the Lair of the Troll King, I can get a huge benefit there. If I give him Pelpit, it's far less. What's going on with that? What's the explanation for it? Is it just the barracks? I'm sure the barracks is va more valuable than any of the buildings I have in Help It. And if I built the barracks over here and Help It, it would be it would help a lot. But it's not just that. There's something else going on. And I'm not quite 100% certain about this, but it's something I've noticed in enough, enough campaigns that I'm my only conclusion is this. Every AI faction in the game, every playable one, every major one, so Castalton, Trog, Azazel, what they all have in common, the thing that Creative Assembly did is that they've made it so certain territories, certain regions are very high priority for a faction to control. So the reason Castalton is willing to vassalize for help uh, for the Lair of the Troll King as opposed to help it basically boils down to, and you can even see this in game, is that it's just considered highly valuable territory. It says economic value, it's not economic value. So my conclusion with this, the conclusion that I've had, and I've had it ever since I noticed this with Arkan and Cetra, with Rapunz specifically. So uh, if you play a campaign as Arkan or Cetra, if you take the Great Desert of Araby and sell it to Rapunz, she's almost certainly going to be willing to become a vassal regardless of your diplomatic relations because it's almost, because it's going to be worth 200 in a diplomatic deal. So my conclusion is, Castalton really likes the Lair of the Troll King. He wants it, he's hard-coded for this. And you can actually notice this in a regular campaign. If you play as Katrin, for instance, as Kislev, one of the scenarios you may encounter is, let's say, you know, you deal with Frot, you deal with Prague, you deal with Azazel, so Castalton's not at war with anyone, and Krakadraka is still alive. Well, in that case, one of the things that's happened many times to me is that Castalton goes to war with Krakadraka. And my conclusion on that is he wants this province. He's hard-coded to want this province. And that's the reason why he's willing to become my vassal in this case, because I'm offering something that he views as being very valuable, yes. and it is for him. It, figuring out which settlements are very valuable to each faction is a tricky affair, but typically I would say the starting province they are in is always going to be highly valuable, not, not necessarily in every case. Uh, things, uh, locations that may have landmarks, so for instance, if you, Gremgor was to not take a carrot frag or he would lose it, and you took it and traded it to him, he would almost certainly want to become your vassal or ally or all that. It would just be worth a lot in the diplomatic agreement. It takes a lot to figure out, but Typically, you can say, like, if you pay, uh, play a lot of campaigns or if you, let's say you play any campaign and you just toggle Fog of War and see, okay, which territories are each faction going to generally go for, right? Which pieces of land are a faction going to go for? So, for instance, with Alfarian, he's always going to go for Southern Everest. Uh, with Malekif, he's almost uh, certainly going to try and take out Grom Brindle, so the Altar of Ultimate Darkness. With Valkia, Grand for instance, all that kind of stuff, that's the kind of stuff you're looking at. And that's the kind of territory that is exceptionally valuable for a vassalization agreement. And this brings me to how I vassalized Ungrim, Forgrim, and Katrin, because it did play a role, all of this. Here's what I did, just to give the explanation. Forget, uh, like with, uh, with Grimgor and Castalden, I explained it, but let me explain how I was able to vassalize uh, Grimgor, uh, uh, Ungrim, Forgrim and Katrin. So first off, first off, and this is a, a final point. Um, obviously, as I said, as I said before, having positive relations with the faction helps. Now you don't start in a positive relation with uh, Ungrim, but Ungrim does not like Templehof. So you fighting Templehof from the very beginning of the campaign, something that he likes. It won't put your relationship positive, but it will help. It will help things from deteriorating and start improving your relationship. Uh, he doesn't like Zufpar, so I one of the first things I did, like, I took Eshin, this was exactly what I did, I took Eshin, turn one, temp, turn two, temple half, and then I moved on Zufpar in turn four, which Ungrim doesn't like. 
and then I march over here to Grand Peak, which is controlled by the Greenskins he starts a war with. I declared war on those Greenskins, got some money from Mungram, and then took Grand Peak with Vlad and Isabella. And then I built the barracks there and traded to Ungram. And because I had fought Tempelha, fought Zufbar, fought the Greenskins, he was willing to vassalize with me. If I had gotten a peace agreement to Tempelhof, which you, by the way, can after you smashed them up pretty early on, if I had gotten a peace agreement or vassalized Tempelhof, which, again, you can do, because you actually can subjugate vampire factions. Those are the only factions you can subjugate as a vampire count faction. If I had done that, it would not have been possible because my diplomatic relations with him had suffered. But my diplomatic relations had improved enough. It wasn't positive, but it was non-negative enough to prevent it. And I was able to do that. That was the f first one. Then you got Katrin and Forgrim. Let's, uh, with Forgrim, he didn't like that I had wiped that Zufbar, but he did like that I wiped that Skarsnik, took this entire province, built some barracks, not in all of them, so I built the barracks, I think, in Mongo. But regardless, I built some barracks over here, traded all of this to Forgrim. That was not enough to vassalize him. But here's the thing that was happening at the same time. Forgrim was at war with various factions, including Queek, and I had just bankrupted him. So he ended up losing some territory, some armies, or he was at risk of doing so. That made him significantly weaker than me, even if it wasn't necessarily reflected in me either, but it was the practical situation. And then I took Mount Silverspear, built the barracks over here, he's lost it, Drazov got involved in a war, decided to get involved in a war with Drazov. Uh, but took Mount Silverspear, built the barracks there, and sold it to Forgrim. He was willing to vassalize me because between his weakness against other factions and the fact that I was telling and giving him a valuable settlement because of the barracks, not necessarily because his specific AI wants Silver Spear, though I think he usually does. I think he is kind of hard code for it. Uh, I was able to vassalize him. Katrin, even easier. Uh, she likes Ungram. And because Wungram was my vassal, my relationship with him had improved. Like you can see over here that she's actually valuing the gifts that I've given to Karakadrin. Because I have given Karakadrin territory. Like, uh, started a war with Azag, Wungram lost some territory, I took this province, uh, and I gave him back this lair over here. Azag was really smashing uh, Ungram up here. Uh, but beyond that po more positive relationship, I also took the Griffinwood. And... I took the Griffin one, defeated Draka, built a barracks, built an economic structure, tier two settlement, sold that to Katrin. And she was willing to vassalize on the spot. One final thing I want to point out over here before ending this video is that if you're looking to improve your, uh, your relationship with a faction, what you can do is, is this. Let's say I trade more time to uh, Averham over here. Right, so my relation right now is going towards 45. I trade it. Okay. Now that relationship is going to 75. But what if I say had a settlement, another settlement that I could trade over there for more time back? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. In this case, I do. So I can trade Naganhof because it's more valuable. But even if the value is exactly equal or even lesser. Uh, of like if I, if Naganhof was worth less than more time in this case. Agreed. What would happen here is every time I'm doing a trade like this, I'm getting improved diplomatic relations. And the better the relationship you have with a particular faction, uh, the easier certain uh, certain diplomatic arrangements are going to be. Though you gotta, uh, though it gotta be, uh, it has to be pointed out that you know certain settlements uh, may not necessarily be as good, and that also it may take a turn or several turns. Like you may have to wait an extra turn until that improved diplomatic relation takes in. Uh, takes into effect so for instance if i was to end this particular turn right here i wouldn't because obviously i don't actually want to sell big haven to this faction but if i were to wait one particular uh turn over here so let's say we trade that for big haven all that right you can see that 
certain things are becoming easier and easier right here. Uh, and certain settlements, obviously, higher value. But if I waited an extra turn, my relationship with uh, Averheim would be significantly higher. Could vassalize him. I don't want to vassalize him. Minor faction, but just, just something to keep in mind. And yeah, if I ended this particular turn, relationship would be much improved. Easier to get a bunch of agreements over here with them if I really wanted to. That is all. Costine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. My advice on how to use all of this is don't vassalize every minor faction. It's not worth it. You won't gain a lot of money from many of them. Dark Elves are a bit of an exception. Like Minor Dark Elven factions can produce a lot of money for you. But in terms of military value, of course, minor factions are not going to be that great. Ledger and Lord factions are going to be. And it's better to have fewer vassals with more territory than a bunch of minor vassals with less territory. That, that's my perspective on that. It's just going to give you more. Cuisine Sanyat.